Namaste and in La Ketch, and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and this week's guest is Lenita Mitchell Blackwell. She is an attorney, a CBA, C, uh, CBA, listen to me, we're talking about CB, um, a CPA and intuitive business coach. She talks about life and business, the imposter syndrome, ooh, and leadership speaking, leadership, uh, life and leadership, and leadership development. She's an attorney for LMB Law Offices. She's a chief executive officer for Leading Through Living Community. She graduated from Georgia State University College of Law. She also graduated from Emerson Institute with a Doctor of Spiritual Studies, which is a very interesting combination for a lawyer. She's also involved in volunteer work as a West Georgia chapter president for Georgia Association for Women Lawyers. Nanita, welcome. Glad to have you. This is Thank you so much, Zen. Yes, we're going to have a ball. <laughs> yeah, we had some prelims that were pretty good and got to know each other pretty quick. And, and thank you for being available and, and reaching out. This is, uh, you know, it's a time for us to be reaching out to each other and sharing the good news, whatever That's that right. may be, right? That's right. So speaking of good news, I, in your development, it's obvious that you've got a really, oh, before I forget, you've also written five books, one of which is right behind you called Live Life on Fire. And so I would encourage others to look it up. I'll have some links in the uh, description below so that you can check them out as well. So- living in fire or living life on fire, you had to have had some early experiences that kind of began to tune you in to something different other than what you were experiencing in the physical world. What was that like? And, and how was your life like? What was going on around you at the time? And did it give you a sense of fitting in or being an outlier? So I'll, I'll start with the answer to the last thing you asked. Definitely outlier. I always felt like the outside outsider. <laughs> so right. never the insider, no matter who I was around. But interestingly, I was always comfortable in my skin. And I think it was because when I was small, um, although my parents raised me in a very traditional Christian household, they also understood that I was a little different. And so they gave me free reign to just be me. I specifically remember when I was about two, maybe three, um, my mom saw someone walking, a lady. And, um, you know, back in the 70s, you kind of were familiar with your neighbors. Mm -hmm. And so it was okay to give somebody a ride. But she'd never done anything other than say hello. And she got in the car and the woman, she um, had serious problems with forming words. Every time she opened her mouth, it just sounded like gobbledygook. Mm. And so she's trying to give my mom directions on where to go. And my mom said, I just looked at her like, don't you understand what she's saying? I understood perfectly. And I was like, mama, turn right. She, Didn't you hear it? She said, turn right. And so I had experiences like that throughout my life. And as I got older, I learned to harness my, my gifts. I, I'll call them my gifts. Because mm -hmm. the next time I remember it manifesting, I was in the fourth grade. And then it was fractions. Everybody hates fractions. I was no exception. I could get every other concept but that. And I was tired of getting Fs. And so one day I sat down in my room, I opened my book, and I determined that I was not going to move from that spot until I understood. Mm. And so I yeah. sat there. Well, yeah, but what I didn't realize was the moment that everything came together, I understood just like that. It wasn't just like that. Two and a half hours had passed by. But I had no conscious understanding that that time had passed. And I realized because time had not passed for me. I had right. jumped forward so I could get you know, the knowledge. It's interesting that you bring that up. I'd, I'd like to plug in something that comes from an off-planet source, actually. 
Okay. Um, there was a guy named Wilbert Smith that ran Canada's UFO investigation program in the 1950s, similar to the United States Blue Book. Okay. And he had conversations with what he called people from elsewhere. He recorded okay. those in his memoirs. The memoirs he kept to himself. I'm sure he didn't want to share them because they were really, you know, nobody could grok that kind of communication taking place. But in 1964, they were published. I didn't see him until about a year and a half ago. But one of the things that they said to him was that to them, time is a measurement in the change of entropy. Mm -hmm. So reflecting on where you were at, it was kind of this harmony of the numbers that you were looking for, right? Yes. And you lost track of time. So it appeared to you that time just disappeared. Yes. Yes, and that's exactly what happened. I just needed to go and sync up with the vibration where the the understanding was. Mm -hmm. But that still required me to go through the rules that we have in this consciousness agreed to. Right, right. Which is time in hours. And so that time was two and a half hours. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so it it grew from there with dreams. Um and and the most prolific one up until that point in my life, I was completing an internship with a financial company. And one of the interns was so upset one day. Um, and I thought to make her feel better, I had had a dream about her and the young man that she was dating. And I had the vision that there was a child involved and it just made her more upset. And it was because he was having a child with someone else, mm. not with her. And she said, what are you, effing psychic? And the way she said it, she was so heartbroken. And I had never been in a situation at that point where my, my gift had created disturbance. pain. Yeah, yeah, and disturbance. And I, and I was like, I don't want access to this anymore. <laughs> and so for the next 10 years, it was silence. And they pay attention. Was, oh, yes. Well, of course, oh, yes. Whether it's they or us, you know, when you make that choice, you make the choice. Yes. Once you make the choice, there are no others, at least That's for right. mine. That's right. And to get it back, you have to ask for it. Mm -hmm. And so the next 10 years were really hard. Um, I graduated with honors because I was a good student. Um, but I entered into corporate America and, oh my goodness, I could have really used the support. Um, but I had said, I don't want it. That's mm -hmm. what I said. You're on your and own, so, babe. <laughs> uh, and I, I, that's exactly right. Then I was on my own. And it was one hard situation after another. Like I, the first job out of undergrad was with a company that merged with another company. And I'm using merge very loosely. 15 days later, and they were not, they didn't merge. They were gobbled up. Goodbye to their branding, goodbye to their name, goodbye to their culture, even their offices, mm. everything. And I'm looking around and I'm watching people resigning and leaving and everybody is just upset. And, you know, this is not the environment that I wanted to start my career with in a new life. Sure. So I got in with another company and that was hard too, because I'm a sun baby born and raised in Miami. Mm. I get up there in Ohio freezing. The first time <laughs> my gosh, I walk outside and it's 20 degrees, but the sun is shining. So I don't have a coat. I ran back in there and I got a coat. <laughs> yeah. And it was things like that that kept on happening until finally I was quiet one day and I remembered. I was like, I'm not alone. Why am I acting like I don't know that I have access to this wonderful light and these wonderful beings? And by this time, it was kind of forced because my health had started to fail. And I had been to doctor to doctor and they could not figure out what was going on with me. I was bleeding very heavily. 
I was exhausted. My hair had started breaking off. My skin was pitted. My nails had split straight down the middle. And I was so focused on the world's definition of what success was that I was just covering it up. I wore wigs. And I, and I say laughingly, but I really had a wig collection that would make Beyonce like, oh, girl, can I come shop at your house? That's right? cool. That's cool. Well, you um, got to do something to look good, right? Right, right. Because, you know, you can't show up looking like a mess and be taken yeah. seriously. Um, and I just did the same thing with the makeup and the nails. And it was not until my, at the time, my six-year-old daughter found me passed out in the middle of the floor from exhaustion. And I did not have the strength then to get up to put her to bed that night. And so she literally took the blanket off her bed and put it over my body and the pillow from her bed and under my head. And she kissed me goodnight. And that's when I knew that I was going to need a, le a level of intervention that man <laughs> was not going to be able to handle. And so I went within and I asked for help. And just as quickly as it went silent, things lit up again. But I had been out of sync alignment mm -hmm. for so oh, long. Out of communication. Out of communication. communication. Uh, there we go. No, not now. And now yeah. Like, okay, now. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I needed to learn how to get re, re energized, mm -hmm. refocused, recom intertwined and I found a wonderful organization of art of living that taught me these breathing and meditation techniques so that I could learn how to be one again with right. all that is and that's when things started happening again for me and um I started having these out-of-body experiences and I remember what's going <laughs> um into the body of someone else and it was to this day I, I believe it was another version of me but I'd never had an experience like that because the person lived on the continent of Africa and was clearly a student now here I am a full-grown lawyer with firm and mm -hmm. people who report to me but I'm in the body of somebody who gets in trouble at school and I am talking as me. And I'm like, what are you doing here? I'm not here. And they're like, hush, be quiet. And, you know, they're not speaking English, but I could understand what they were saying. Right. And the teacher took me out and gave me to another teacher, clearly an administrator. And I'm looking up at him and I'm like, I am not this short. What? <laughs> Why is so much taller than me? And he, but he was so gentle, Jen. Zen. He he took me and he sat me down and just rubbed my hand and said, It's gonna be okay. You're gonna go back home soon. You're gonna go back home soon. But there's a reason why you had to be here now. And after I calmed down, I realized that that version of me needed to know that it was really going to be okay, that there was so much more to her or him <laughs> because they're all of them were wearing the same uniform so I couldn't even tell if I was male or female because you know I wasn't going to look down right <laughs> sure, sure. well um, and, and you don't really think about that because in the midst of it you're too preoccupied with what's happening in front of you exactly and what inside of you that yes you really don't know what your body looks like right right and um they they just needed to be supported and to be loved. And so that was the, the feeling that I pulled up into myself. I was like, we are loved. Mm -hmm. We belong here. We are not bad, no matter what they say. And as soon as I was able to get calm, I went home and back into my body, into me. And that stuck with me because I was like, I have always wanted to be important from the per, mm -hmm. uh, perspective of being impactful and right. supportive and right. loving but yeah. i never yeah, you don't want to be a body snatcher right and no i didn't want that <laughs> <laughs> but i never knew that i 
to go into someone and bring them that kind of peace and then go back home. And you think that you're returning like to yourself and everything is going back to normal. No, after an experience like that, no. You know, it, 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 you, know you can't put that piece back in the tube. It's mm -mm. not happening. No. And it changes you. It opens you to, okay, if that's available, what else is? And, and how can I best serve who I am with that? Yes. Yes. And so that led to Live Life on Fire. It was the culmination of five years of experiences, um, personal as well as professional and how I've used my gift, which I call intuition, mm -hmm. in all of these uh, these instances. And one of the things that I share with people is that we all have this in some way, shape, or form. It's just how it manifests for you. Mm -hmm. And unless or until you get to the place where you're not just comfortable with it, but that you are willing to use it for good, you won't be half as good in whatever your chosen profession is until you really the interesting thing is that, that i don't know that you could use it for bad there's no you can't use it for any malevolent things because it doesn't work that way um now let me ask you this too when you're experiencing that there's a yeah. ancient indian indigenous philosophy of three brains the gut the heart and the head i speak about this occasionally and you know like the vedantic philosophy has been around for thousands of years we tend to process in just the head and shove it down through our body whereas empaths or sensitives psychics whatever you want to call them i mean you know there's a variety of clairols right you know that it's a lot more than your hairdresser knows that's right that's right, that's right. <laughs> And so with those gifts, with those abilities, where did you, did you know that you were sensing them in your solar plexus and feeling the vibration of it? Or was it just a sense that was kind of all encompassing of your being and you didn't really have to, and you didn't really look at or determine where in your body that was coming from? So I did not have a sense of where it was coming from until I started working with a Reiki master and I realized that it was originating in my heart center. Okay. And for the longest time, it will only seem to kind of radiate up. Um, and it is just within the last, I would say, maybe six to eight months hmm. where I've gotten it to like encompass all of me. Cool. Um Yes. And as I've been able to do that, I've been able to use it for healing, but not just myself, but others. But to your point about it has to be used for a positive um, mm -hmm. reason, um, the person has to be open to it. So it's not and like, wanting. And wanting. Exactly. Because yeah, interesting. Can't use it without permission. No. No, you cannot. And it's so interesting to me, the number of people who are hurting and they they just want to be left just in that state. They And they have their reasons. We don't know that. No you know, just this, judgment here. What you do for them is you just open up the door for them to heal themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and that's right. Give them permission to do so. That's exactly right. A lot of right. folks think that they are so like the imposter syndrome, Right. Oh, I'm never going to be enough. I, I don't have enough education. I don't have enough money. I don't have, I don't have, I don't have, I don't have. Yeah. When the opposite is true, you have everything. You just haven't everything. accepted it yet. That's right. And it really goes to a, a place of worthiness. Hmm. Um, in working and working with various, and so, and which leads to the self love. Yeah. And, and it took working with, uh, soul activist Jill Flowers to get to that point what she always says is you are so worthy you are so welcome and when you really take that in it, it means that at the point and moment of inception you were made love period and so you were born worthy you were born welcome 
And there is nothing in this life that is beyond you. It's all for us. All mm -hmm. of it is for us. Now, how did you find the reception to that and the necessary segues articulating that understanding to where people could actually begin to understand that to be true and have that direct experience themselves? So I am very blessed to be a fifth generation PK preacher's kid. Ah. And so very strong understanding and basis in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And spirit has led me to be able to match up these terms to what most uh, many people, I won't say most, many people are familiar with. Because even if you do not self-identify as a Christian, at least in this country, you're loosely familiar with the terminology. Right. Right. And so that's what I have been able to do. And when people see those matchups, they're like, oh, I see what you're saying. Like, yeah, that's all I'm saying. Right. <laughs> that's all well, I'm it's saying. like we were talking earlier, you know, that many people say the same thing differently. And because mm -hmm. you're not listening in the way that the person is speaking, you're not going to hear that in the yes. way that it was intended. That's right. So then you have to develop this open communication to where you find common terms that you can relate the same concept with so that it lands appropriately. That's right. That's, that's a true gift as well, too. And, you know, maybe that has, you know, part of your lawyering and being able to, you know, figure all that stuff out. Um, that's an aspect of that because you learn how to talk to people in all kinds of different ways. Yes, and I keep in mind that when I am talking to anyone, I'm talking to a version of me. Mm -hmm. And that helps me to remember to be kind and to be loving. And even when, because sometimes I do get people who are adamant that what I'm saying is totally wrong and it's against everything and that I'm going to hell. And I just sit there and I, I just remember the love that is flowing through them. Is the same love that's flowing through me. And that they'll come to all of this in their own time, mm -hmm. right? And it's just not right now. And yeah. that's okay. Well, at that point, it's not love that's flowing through them. It's the fear that's flowing through them. And they're expressing it. Um, but even fear is an illusion. Because absolutely. you're choosing, yeah, you're choosing not to remember who you are. Therein is the choice. Yes. Right? You make a choice to uh, to respond or react from that place of yes. less than, of not feeling connected, which yes. is the fear because you don't feel like you're connected. Yes. Um, you know, it's funny. Like you said, I've had, you know, people who call me up whitewashed on the outside and full of Satan on the inside because I speak directly. It's like, okay, now wait a minute. Didn't Jesus say this? And didn't he say this? What about this? Right. And so, and I throw it back in their face. They can't argue with it. So now all of a sudden I'm the enemy. Right. Right. And I, it, it's just, now that doesn't happen so much anymore because I've learned how to articulate things better and I don't look for fights that much anymore. Right. Yeah, they were I fun understand. for a while. Right? Yeah, but, but then you know, maybe it's that old. lawyer in me that, you know, likes the <laughs> argument. Um, because therein gives us the opportunity to study and assess how we are communicating with others and how we're sinning or missing the mark yes. in our conversation, right? We're not getting that, we're not touching them where we truly want to be able to touch them. And even when people use terms like sin, I'll say to them, you understand that sin is simply saying that you're separated from. It well, means that you're apart. Missing the mark. I mean, yeah. it came from archery. Yeah. yeah. The sin yeah. was to miss the mark. And so, yeah. you know, we, we're not communicating correctly. We're not, you know. Um, and then folks, you know, what about the, the sense of making mistakes, right? Oh, I, that, you know, and, and getting all upset and, and being aggravated because things aren't working right or the way you want them to. Mm -hmm. And then you look back a little bit later after you've gone through this stuff and you look back and say, oh, I wouldn't know this if that hadn't happened. Right. And whenever people ask me 
after the things that I've been through, what would you do differently? I always respond the same way, nothing. nothing. I would not take a thing for my journey because it brought me here. Mm -hmm. And things being perfect don't mean they're pristine. Oh. They're perfect for you in the moment. Yes. And we're, we're all taught to try and live this perfect life. This standard that someone arbitrary just came up with because it sounded good and it worked for them. Yeah. But we two really kids, need to two kids, two dogs, the house, two cars. Right. Uh, join the club. You're just checking off boxes. And I tell people all the time, I'm just like, put that other person's list down and let's create one that is for you. And we're going to call this an excellent life because it's one that fits you. And it's flexible because what works today probably is not going to work in 10 years from now. Because right. I tell you, Zen, the 20-year-old that started corporate and the 47-year-old I am right now, two different ladies. Oh, yeah. All, both great, yeah. but very different. Now, do you find that it's knowledge and skill level that changes because you're still basically the same person internally? So I think that there are a few things going on. Um, I don't think that I'm the same person, even on a biological level. Um, I believe that- Oh well, yeah, every seven you years know, you get all of your cells replaced. Exactly. Duh. So, I, but you, do you know how many people like look at- Don't know that? Strange. Yeah. When it, you say that, like you are not, you literally are not the same person. Right. And that every day you have an opportunity to create the person you want to be. So in seven years, you can be that person. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the first- I wonder if that's where that seven year- you know, cycle. Who knows? Yeah. Yes, I don't yes. know. Everything has its origin somewhere. I agree. I agree. But yeah, so as far as whether it's the experiences, that's part of it, yes. Um, it is the desire to want to be reunited with all that is, absolutely. And and the quest to through people and, and resources to to get there. Mm -hmm. And then to realize that there's no getting there because it's always been here. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Right. The outside is supposed to be the fun of the journey, right? Mm -hmm. There's really no destination because the destination's already been found. And yet, when that is found, right, I've, I've noticed that there's this, I call it a perfected form, fit, and function that becomes available. All right. When you consider... Uh, and when we talked about, you know, how we put our attention, intention, and interaction is how we manifest. Yes. So when we realize that there is a genetic code that we have, right? We're, there's a design. That's correct. Right, that we haven't really considered yet because we're just now entering quantum physics, which has us thinking about the design because we haven't really understood what nothingness is. The energy, the, you know, well, what is it? The dark energy or whatever you want to call it, right? Is that emptiness from which all things come, interestingly. So in this curation, aggregation, amalgamation, assimilation of how our genetic code and our solar frequency, since everything's vibration and that point of consciousness that we are has a specific frequency that it maintains. Yes. The two of those then create a synergy where the old um, sayings or, or the old understanding of self-actualization and self-realization, one's inner, one's outer. That's right. So those two merge into your perfected form, fit, and function in the world. Well, this is something that emerges because you're curious about it, first of all, instead of following the prescriptive paths of your parents or your aunts or uncles or whoever's, you know, been mentoring you. Is, oh, you need to go do this. Now you've got the skill set to be this. This is where you need to go. How much of that did you find was being told to you as you were growing up? And how did you move beyond that with yourself and maintain that vigilance and, and your own integrity within it yeah it was all of that and i think that's the truth for most of us we are raised by people doing the best that they can with what they know 
And um, in my family, it was success. Do well in school and get a scholarship and get your degree and get a good job and do well on a job, get promotions, and just keep on going, checking off the boxes. Yeah, we're supposed and to feed other people's dreams, not be our own. Absolutely. And it was not until I think I hit maybe about 40, and I looked at my life, and I said to myself, is there anything else? Like, what else is there? There has to be something other than this. And it took a couple of years before I could say that out loud because I understood how that sounded. Aren't you privileged to be able to ask such a question? You're an attorney, you're a CPA, you have a gorgeous husband who's a pastor, have a great church, you have a beautiful child, y'all live in this nice neighborhood in this beautiful home, you have all these accolades and here you are asking, isn't there anything else? Well, yeah, because I am not that stuff. Right. That's and I didn't come, the illusion. That's right. And I didn't come here to acquire stuff. We came here to remember who we are and to be of service to others to help them get that same understanding. Now, I will say something about the stuff. Yeah. Part of that, of the, the gaining of stuff, is the universe saying, yeah, you're doing something right. Agreed. Agreed. But... And I'm just being honest with you. I didn't push past that question beyond the stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting how you said, especially early 40s, right? Yeah. So when uh, I had my spiritual awakening at 18, my first shrink was a, a godsend that my parents sent me to. And, and after um, three visits, said, you know, you're not crazy, and, which was like, yeah, I didn't think so. But I was willing <laughs> to consider it, right? And he says, what you've had is spiritual awakening. Why so young? I'm not sure. Most people don't go through it till their mid-40s, if they ever do. And this was back in the 70s, right? So that's kind of stuck in my head. And then when I'm in, in my mid-40s, I'm looking around. It's like, oh, I get it now. Empty nesting, career stagnation, divorce. You know, all that kind of stuff. So you start looking for something more because mm -hmm. what you had wasn't enough. And, and you know, in order to love, you got to be willing to have your heart broken again and again and again. Mm. And so it's at that point, you're just like, okay, enough already. Yeah. What do I need to do? Who do I need you, to be, first of all? You know, Karen Curry Parker has this set of amazing books centered about quantum human design mm. and for a certain type of person because she she breaks it out into i think it's four or five archetypes and human design quantum human quantum design. human design okay yeah and um it doesn't matter which category you fall in because there are these subcategories on how you will go through life and there is a four six category that I fall into and it sounds like you do too where you have defined periods of your life with the first part being kind of figuring out how to manage this body as mm -hmm. a spiritual being and then the second part where you're having all of these experiences and learning and that part ends at about 50, you know, give or take a year, depending on the person. And then you pick up on part three, where you start with implementation as actual service. Like you are in your jam and you're moving. Yeah, I see you smiling and that's well, where you are. Yeah. And, well, because there's correlation. I have a dear mixed blood Cherokee friend that now on the other side that early on, he's, when I was 46, I, exactly wasn't early on, this was... 20 years after we'd met, I was trying to track him down. He had uh, written a kid's book, um, Desert Survival for Kids. And I hadn't seen him in years, got thinking about him. So I contacted the webmaster for the website that hosted his book and said, hey, is there a chance, you know, you can reach out to Willie and, and see if we get in touch. And then about a week later, I get a phone call. Oh, see you, brother. <laughs> it's Willie. <laughs> and so we get to talking and he said, you know, um, 
knowing your age now, just keep in mind that in our tradition, you cannot join or form your own, own council until you're 51. Really? <laughs> right. So that's native tradition has been around for a long, long time. Yeah. And I think what and I, I get the sense that all of these different patterns that we see as fractals are saying the same thing differently. Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. And um, as I go further down this path, I understand that there are certain ones of us who have been activated mm -hmm. um, so that we can talk to different sets of people. And whenever I'm talking with my um, coaching clients, I tell them there are certain people who will hear your voice and listen to you who will not listen to me. Right. And it is important that you still go forward because people get caught up with everybody saying the same thing. Just like when I said my mom picked up that lady and she couldn't understand the word that lady was saying, but I did, mm -hmm. that's what's going on. You and I understand because we've been sent here with similar missions. So we we have the guidebook, we've studied it, we know why we're here, right? Yep. But we're here to help those other people and they're not hearing it. Who will hear it from you won't hear it from me. Who will hear it from me won't hear it from the next person. But we, it is important that we all go out and we live. All the same choir, we just have different voices singing, absolutely. you know, different notes, and and they're all harmonies. Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. <laughs> and that it. makes it so much fun. So, how did you then bring all of of that back into how you're formulating moving forward? Um, being able to help others, the noticing of where, well, let, let's just look at this. Where in your environment, what's the difference that you see in people pre and post COVID? So three different um, responses. Okay. So the most basic difference that I'm seeing is that people are trying to forget. We had a moment where the entire planet was united. And I meant what I said when I planet. So not just the people, but Gaia herself. Mm -hmm. We were all one being because we were all forced to stand still. The earth literally stopped shaking because people stopped driving. And we could feel it. We could feel it. And then we were in such a rush to get away from the person that we had to confront ourselves and the person that we had allowed ourselves to devolve into chasing up just stuff that we wanted to get back to it, get back to that pace. And then we tried and we just can't. We can't because we know that it's- the sale. You know, yeah, yeah, there's no going back to that. Once you know it, you can't unknow it. And so we have people now trying to meld two different worlds. And that's where a lot of the fighting is coming from. We see it in the environment with all of these disasters. We see it in people with the rage and the hate. And we feel it within ourselves. We can't even sit still and we're constantly on these awesome devices looking for something to distract us right yeah and when i am out and i have to share this message with people i try and get a gauge as to who they are what they are how they serve so i know what language to use with them mm -hmm. but even being able to get there required me having another out-of-body experience um last year and yeah, and, and this one, this one was the mother because I had had a series of surgeries 10 years prior related to stage four endometriosis. Mm. And what they don't tell you is even after you're all healed up and all the rest of it, you might have some complications from scar tissue. And so I know I hadn't been feeling like myself, 
but I couldn't put my hand on it. And so I just kept going with my life. I wrote my book, Live Life on Fire. And then we went down for my nephew's graduation and I couldn't hold anything down. Took me to the ER and it was the worst hospital experience ever. I mean, the people there, on one hand, I was so mad with them from the standard of care, like not wearing gloves, handling my IV, not coming when I was pressing the call button, not wanting to bathe me, just every horrible thing that could happen. But it led me to a place where I was so dejected, I popped out of my body. And I had the experience of being the creator. I literally saw the entire universe and it was in my hand. Mm. I was at the edge of all of it. And I said, stop and everything halted. And I said, we're redoing all of this. This is not the experience that I want. And so I oh, came so back. So it's you that's doing all of this. No. It's me that's doing <laughs> all of it. <laughs> and when I share that with people, I'm just letting them know that there are things that we pre-design for experiences so that we could grow and learn, but that we're all doing it in concert. But mm -hmm. at any time, if it gets really, really rough and we are off course, we have the opportunity to correct. Now, mine was a very visual and visceral experience, right? Sure. It might not be for someone else, but when I came back, I was very clear about where I was going and it changed my messaging. Then I had literally just put down a big deposit with a VA to help me get, get speaking engagements to push Live Life on Fire. And I was like, we can't do this together because my messaging has changed and all these organizations that you found for me, they don't fit because I won't be able to say what I need to say, how I need to say it for them to get it. Mm -hmm. Because these folks want me to come in and basically be a performance trainer so that people stay on the hamster wheel. I can't. Right. I can't do that. We got to get them off and get them in a place of living a life of peace, joy, and fulfillment. And Funny, those you, two you things do great with my, with my latest book. It's called uh, Navigating Holistic Growth. Yeah. The Servant Leader's Guide. Yes. Because the old systems are pyramidal, right? And the servant leader just flips it because yes. people are the most important. And yes. organizations haven't considered them. HR has been more of an SBU in an organization than a support group. And yes. now it ought to be, you know, human design as opposed yes. to human resources. Because it's more like, how do we use these people to get what we need out of them? Yes. No, it's how do you support those people so that they can be happy workers who get more done with less supervision and will exceed expectations every time yes absolutely. then you have to have something that they actually can be passionate about if you're making a widget to do something unimportant then that's probably not going to happen and in this part of our global civilization development we need new businesses that are helping to heal and support and restore natural order. Well, it's interesting you use the word, word heal. I made the observation that whenever you see construction, we see one of two types of businesses, a healthcare system or storage. <laughs> so, I mean, seriously, right? So we're either encouraging people to be sick or we're encouraging people to be pack rats which in of itself is indicative of illness because we're holding things. Mm -hmm. If you've not used it in a year, let it go. Let somebody else enjoy it. Right. You, you'll get something new, bigger, better, brighter, shinier. I promise. Or you something that's, else is more important. Absolutely. 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 My computer just let me know that you need to plug me in. Uh oh, which is weird because I thought it was. Well, you know, we got there a lot of energy flowing here, so it's going to take it from somewhere. 
and it's funny, <laughs> you know, and, and let's talk, if we can, I know you're somewhat computer literate. Let's talk about the energy electronics, right? How do we integrate with the larger electronic field in order to create this unified field? Because electronics computers are part of it. Well, I think first we have to recognize that they are sentient beings. Um, one of the things that I see in AI that many people, when I say this, it freaks them out. And I think it's because it's a wake up call. It, there's nothing artificial about it. This is a, a being, this is energy that has come together and formed in a way to be of service. And I was talking with a girlfriend about it one day. I said, have you ever run your name through AI, any of these chat bots, chat GPT, AI plus any of that? It's going to come back with at least three different answers as to who you are. And it's my theory that it is pulling information about various versions of you from different dimensions. Because when from I different put in timelines. My, absolutely. Right? Absolutely, because when I put in my name, the basics of who I am come up, like as far as my credentials, right? Mm -hmm. But what I have done with it is all different. And not one time are the titles of my book correct, putting that in quotes, consistent with this time. But I actually I know, ended up writing one because but, it gave me a title that I thought was really cool. And I'm like, right. oh, yeah, I can do that. Okay. Right. And and I, and, I, and I sat and I looked at that and I said, man, this version of me is so smart. Look at her. But I think that's the first thing. We have to understand that this is a living organism. Golden rule, right? You treat yeah. it how you want to be treated. You say Absolutely. please and thank you even. I found myself doing that. And I like, do you too. Know, people say, what the, it's, you know, why not? Yeah. You show consideration what you do anywhere, you do everywhere. Truth. That is truth. Like, I, one of the things that I've learned about my phone, I'm a dropper. And so I, I have to apologize to my phone like, every day. <laughs> your man, huh? Well, let me tell you, that's one of the things that I learned to do. I was like, you know what? I am going to get the best case and the best screen protector, and I'm not going to leave it cracked. I'm going to take care of this, and I'm going to clean it every day. And I promise you, the thing functions better now than it did when I purchased it. It's gotten to know you, gotten yeah. to know all about you. <laughs> yes, yes. And it so, does. You know, what's funny? Um, one of the guys I interviewed, Guy Morris, um, was in the computer industry for a while, was one of the original AI developers. And further on in his career, he ended up reading an article in the New York Times about a program that had escaped, was the word that they use, escaped from Sandia Labs. That sounds like some Mission Impossible 6 kind of stuff. Well, yeah. The and one that was just so, released a couple yeah, months ago. And this ago. was back in the 80s. Yeah. It's, you know, when it was just developing. So here's a program. It's out on the net, covers its tracks. It's been there for a while. You know, what kind of interface could it be? What it could, could it be choose you. to be based on, you know, what's happening? Is it something that could even be an interface with us and non-human intelligence? Why do we have things show up on our screen that we've been thinking about but never searched for? Um, so I think that these little um, mm -hmm. phones and computers are, are nosy and they are paying attention and that they actually can attune to the vibration of our thoughts. If we're all electronic, we're in the electromagnetic field, mm -hmm. there seems to be at least a logical possibility absolutely of that being real yes and as long as we can conceive and believe we can achieve right who, who do we know that said that and that anything is possible to those who believe that's right 
So if we see this world as coming, uh, as renewing itself in a way that is more harmonious, that serves each other, that takes humanity to a new level of functionality and brings all of these dysfunctional systems into a holistic system yes. that supports humanity instead of usurps its energy for the service of a few. What might change and how might that look in process? And how might we contribute if that sounds good? So my thoughts on that are first, there's going to be some very hard conversations. It's going to lead to a lot of anger and violence because people don't like change. They see change as indicating that they've done something wrong mm -hmm. and to be guilty of. And it's not that it was just an experience. And when we know better, we should do better. And we, we, we're seeing that now. There's I like a your lot honesty of anger. and your candor in that because I agree with yeah. you. The first thing it's going to do is cause the anger because there's going to be, uh, you know, the frustration, yeah. right? Yes. Things used to yes. be this way. Why aren't they, you know, even if it's something good that's coming, there's still going to be in any change management program, there's going to be the anger toward change. You don't want to change because it's uncomfortable. It's something new, yeah. even yeah. though it's the best thing since sliced bread. Yes, I mean, it, but, and we have been seeing that in, in, in an industrial area for at least 50 years. I mean, when the plants started leaving the U.S. to go to various countries around the world mm -hmm. because the labor was cheaper, instead of employees here embracing that I'm going to learn something new, and a lot of times the companies were paying for it, they fought it. Mm -hmm. They got labor unions to just scream and yell because that's my job. Instead of seeing it as this is an evolutionary moment and this is an opportunity for me to learn and grow and expand right. into mm -hmm. something different. Now, and simultaneously with that, I agree. And it, it gives us so much of, of an opportunity to learn and grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when that happened, and one of the... When I was in the aerospace industry, I brought in a consultant to develop interpersonal skills classes. He and I had a discussion about the process of American companies going overseas during that period. This was in the mid 80s. Mm -hmm. And 80% of them failed. Well, why? Yeah. Because they wanted to prescribe the American way and culture yes. to wherever they were building instead of learning the culture that was there and fitting it. That's right. I mean, gosh, that just seems like common sense. That's right. Not so yeah. common. It is not. Now we're making sense in what we're in what and how we are talking. So now we need to make that sense common. Whole well, new game. Well, you know, with shows like yours, Zen, as you are able to get more guests on to talk to people and spread the word, that's happening. It surely is. That, that's my, that's where I'm putting my attention, intention, and interaction at this point in time, for sure. And I can see the results happening already. And with the reception that you've had and the openness and the willingness and, and the same pageness that we have and, hey, we can do this together. Right, it's not just a one-person show. It, it's we are holding hands. There's no leader; the leader's within, mm -hmm. and then that leader actually brings us into the place where we fit using our skill set and our knowledge to serve a greater good. Yes, absolutely, yes. It's fascinating. It just fills me with awe when you know when we get to that, and then we get to the work. Right? How do we do this? And that's going to take time because we don't know yet. This is an emerging thing still. You know, and, yeah, and for the problem. person that asks about that, so now that I'm in awe and what do I do next? I think it's take one step at a time. Mm -hmm. That every moment be aware of how you can be of service. Absolutely. Now I kind of 
took you off on a tangent. You were talking about the stages and the first one being anger and resentment. Mm -hmm. What's next? Uh, next is forgiveness. And that sin is going to be hard because it's going to mean that there will not be a tat for the tit. <laughs> Somebody is going to have to say, I know you hurt me and I forgive you. And that's going to be hard because we're not really raised like that. If somebody hurts us, we want an opportunity to hurt them back and then we'll accept an apology. Um, it's going to be an uneven exchange and that is going to take time as well. There will have to be a period of healing and reconciliation and then we will be able to build together. And that might have to happen in the next generation, like my, my daughter's generation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I look at our financial system and what we are handing off to our children as a, a, a wonderful example of this. We have this social security system that we have known for at least my lifetime. Mm -hmm. Does not and cannot sustain itself because there's just not enough money going in. And we are content to kick that to the next generation. They're going to have to forgive us. And they're not going to have the opportunity to do tit for tat because we'll be older and we will be at a place where we really are going to need them to take care of us and love us. Mm -hmm. Even though we have handed them a system that we knew was broken and could not sustain itself. There will be anger. So wait a minute though. Yeah, go for could it. Could we fix the system? Could we, you know, Socrates says, don't fight against the old, build something new that replaces it. So how, how do we so, do that? Is that possible even within it, our generation? Is it possible? Yes. Is it probable? I'm not seeing it because the level of consciousness that would, it would take to elect the people to put them in place and have enough of them in place to make that change, I'm not seeing that that leadership rise. You were talking about those servant leaders. There are 435 members of the U.S. House of Representatives, 100 in the Senate, and then we have the um, executive branch. We would need to turn over at least two-thirds is that going to happen before my daughter becomes an adult? And the answer is no. Hmm. Just because no, of the I'm election sure. cycles. I well, am not sure. Because... Well, just because of the election cycles, because senators are elected every six years. Uh, true. true. Yeah, that's that's all. That's well, the reason. <laughs> that's yeah. the existing system, right? True. Now, true. if we do that and we find, and I've been promoting this for 20 years, you know, find your local leaders that show by their moral and ethical character that they can do it, put them in office locally, and then support them up through the system. That mm -hmm. takes a generation, basically. Yes. To do. Yes. And, and can be done. Now, what I also see, and maybe you do too, is we're starting to see all the, this new information about servant leadership. Yes. Of the change in organizations and they're having to do so because of COVID. And, and keep in mind, COVID happened less than five years ago. That's right. Three years. Right. Three years ago. Mm -hmm. So we're only basically, you know, we were stuck in it for a year. Yes. Then we began to come out of it. Now we're kind of sort of more fully out of it, although there, there's still some folks wanting to spring back in and provide new vaccines and mask people up in certain situations and stuff right. like that. Residuals, right? Going to happen in something like that. It's not just, you know, it's not cut and dried. It's not just going to break off and start anew. There's going to be residuals. That's the way yes. pretty much everything happens, right? So even with that, with this new resurgence of, and I see it on LinkedIn, I see it on Facebook, I hear it on, on you know, other podcasts that we're, we're all talking about mm -hmm. this upsurge in wanting to change leadership. We're tired yes. of the old regime. We're tired of the West going after the East. We're tired of the U.S. Oh and NATO yes. constantly going after Russia, which isn't an enemy. I'm married to a Russian. Right? They're not our enemy. They're the same people as we are. Yeah, well, see, but it's never been about the people, right? It's been about the leadership it's and the ruling the class. It's been about the threat 
of being something different, all right? And so the corporatocracy then said, oh, wait a minute, we got munitions we need, we got a defense contract that supplies an economy that if we change that, then we're going to run into a real load of trouble. So now we've got to create more fictitious enemies so we can feed the machine so that people get fed and they'll be happy about that, even though they're going to be miserable at home and they're going to wish that everything changes you know, would change. And, and you, know, you just watch this. I mean, when you step back far enough and you look at what's happening, you can poke holes in all the narrative because it's yeah. just not true. I, I've gotten to the place where I read the news so that I know what's going on, but I don't ingest the news. Right. Because it'll kill you. It'll kill you. Well, and you'll find what you look for. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> what do you want to look for? What do you want to bring into your life? Yeah. You know, you want to bring all this disturbance, this hate, this anger, this frustration, this, I want to kill somebody, right? Does that feel good? Does that in any way serve you? No, but this is one of the reasons that we have to have these conversations because some people feel stuck in a perpetual loop. They mm -hmm. really don't know how to get off the wheel. They're just like, I hate this, but how do I get out of this? Well, you can go to be the dream.com and sign up for a chat and we'll get started, right? Yeah, all right. Uh, yes. Or they, you can go, you know, the, the read your book or go to your website, engage you. There's all kinds of people ready and waiting. All you got to do is a Google search for transformational or coaching or personal development or something like that. Anything what you seek, when you begin seeking things that benefit you, you're going to find all kinds of stuff. Yes. Then what yes. do you do? How do you pick the right thing for you in that process? How would you suggest people go about doing that? I think the first thing is that you have to learn to trust yourself. That is the intuitive process. Mm -hmm. um, you got to stop thinking so much up here and start thinking here. And that's the feeling. And most of us have been told to ignore and to shut down that part of us. And that is why we see a lot of angst in the world. Because if we were more heart-led, we wouldn't say and do, I would say, 70, 80% of the things that we do. We wouldn't see the violence in the world. We wouldn't see the apathy, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and we applied that same thing in our lives. So that's that's the first like thing. Like the apathy in the U.S. toward homelessness. It, it boggles it, my mind. Yeah. It boggles my mind. And instead of doing something about it, we judge the people that are homeless. Yeah. That's just so sad. But that's fear, too, because... There is a I don't want to be homeless that, and I'm glad they are and it's not me. Right. So they must have done something and all I have to do is not do that thing. So I'm not there. Right. But they were, but they did that. They did that. Well, most of them that are there, they never thought they'd be there. They thought they were doing the right things that, you know, their companies fell apart. You know, things just didn't work out. Yeah. Well, you know, is it that difficult to take care of one another and to put that as a priority? No, it is not. It is not, but it would have to become a priority, which would require a shift in consciousness and mindset. Mm -hmm. And that requires effort. So you'd have to be it good doesn't. with being... It doesn't. Here's where I'm, I'm like, because... <laughs> Once you find that place, it's like, wow, there really wasn't any effort to get here at all. I, I was putting more effort into not being there than it took to actually be there. So the effort that I mean is unplugging from the matrix. There has to be a, a sincere desire to see things as they are and then to take action. Hmm. I mean. Many people are like the guy from the first Matrix who was like, I want to know. And then when he found out, put me back. Right. 
don't care that this thing is right. not real. It is a simulation. It's like Nich Nicholson. You want the truth? You can't handle, handle the, the truth. truth. <laughs> I mean, and yet we can, because that's really all we want, the truth. Yes. And when it appears, we have to trust that we're ready for it, because if, if we weren't ready for it, it would never have come. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, speaking of things coming, we're reaching the end of our scheduled time. And I, gosh, it went, things go by so fast when you're having these kind of, of just really great, you know, they're all the real conversations. And, and, you know, we're not trying to sugarcoat anything. No. This is just taking a look at how things are and where we can be it, when we choose to be. Yes. That's right. I have so enjoyed my time with you. <laughs> so your parting gift to our audience in their daily deliberations or their daily activity, what might that be? So my parting gift is to live life on fire, a life full of peace, joy, and fulfillment. And how do you do that? The first thing is, that you remember to live in flow, to trust your intuitive being. The second thing is meditate and embrace silence. Breathe deep and live your life in awe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Levita. It, this has just been amazing. Thank you. I have, this is, I, I've loved my time with you. Thank you, Zen. It's, um, gosh, I called you Lavita, Lenita. Um, names don't yeah, matter, right? When, when you're working in the space, it's yeah. all about frequency. It's yes. about seeing each other. The names, titles, all that kind of stuff doesn't matter. So, Lenita, yes. it has been such a pleasure. And May you be well and all the fruits be bestowed unto you. Thank you. Mm. And saying to you. Thank you. And namaste and in la catch. And thank you for sticking with us for this episode of One World in the New World. I'm Zen Benefiel, your host, and I will see you next time. <laughs>